for my presentation on election 2016, the pie chart, how did this happen? Um, I actually originally entitled it election 2016 WTF, <laughs> meaning what's the formulation. However, um, I received the gracious editing of the Cycle History Association, and they took the WTF. But maybe we need to have the WTF back in. In any case, uh, here we are. And uh, uh, here's the pie chart, and we'll come back to that. Uh, here's my contact information. And um, if anyone would like a PDF on request, just send me an email, and, uh, and I'll be glad to send you one. Um, background to the presentation. In the summer of 2016, I made a couple of bets with guys a bottle of wine each that Trump would win. And, um, and I didn't want him to win. Uh, I mean, my attitude is I think it's a national disaster. Um, I'm a musician. I recorded a bass solo. It's on, it's on YouTube, January, which I posted on Inauguration Day. And the first part of it is the Star Spangled Banner on the bass, and the second part of it is Taps. So that's kind of my attitude. But I thought Trump had a very good chance of winning. Is the sound all right? Is it too loud? No, 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 it's good. Thank you. Um, so in, uh, in conversations after the election, um, I was talking with people about how come I thought it would happen, and what they think, and so on. And I began to get the idea of that uh, there's a pie chart of reasons why this national disaster, which was so shocking, happened. And so, now my, my attitude is um, uh, what I call a kind of ruthless um, reality. If we're going to look at something, we've got to look at it and really try to not keep our illusions going. So that, that's the attitude that I bring through. I think a lot of psychotherapy, actually, a lot, a lot of what brings us as patients or our patients to us into psychotherapy is trying to hold on to illusions in the face of reality, which is uh, disaffirming those illusions. So now we're in a national condition of that, or many of us are. Okay. The proportions of each item in the pie chart, total guesstimate. I have, you know, I mean, like relatively, and a lot of them overlap, but, you know, it's just so I'm not, I'm not sticking to the proportions, but we'll see what it is. All right, full credit to Hillary Clinton and the Dems. They won the popular vote by nearly 3 million, but lost the election. Ruthless reality, the solution that we talked about. Okay, number one, the disenfranchised, formerly middle class men, I'm guessing maybe 30% of the loss. Um, this is important. Um, and there's a psychologist named Hadley Cantrell that nobody's ever, anybody here ever heard of Hadley Cantrell? Yay, yay, all oh, right, psycho history, go. Um, Hadley Cantrell, in 1941, wrote a book called The Psychology of Social Movements. Among the social movements he studied were the rise of Nazism in Germany after World War I, and the rise of lynchings in the South, in the American South, after the Civil War. Um, and Cantrell discovered remarkable similarities in the social conditions that gave rise to both movements. Clustered around extreme socioeconomic disenfranchisement of a previously established middle class. The elevator speech for what Cantrell found out is that it's not the very poor people who make a social revolution, it's the disenfranchised middle class. Watch out for that. The extremely disenfranchised middle class. Um, Cantrell's application of the psychology of his time to understanding social movements and his use of the male pronoun shouldn't prevent us from incorporating his knowledge as we try to learn the lessons of election 2016. Uh, in fact, it was largely based on, on the basis of Cantrell's work that I uh, won those uh, two bottles of wine with great remorse but no reluctance in collecting those bets. So, what did he find? Status is a key psychological factor. A person places himself in some definite relationship to his social world, with an ego that is largely composed of common social values. We feel about ourselves, who I am, my identity, so largely composed of common social values in the world that I'm in. Standards of judgment and ego needs 
create the priority of some needs, such as a person's right to live in peace with his family over others during times of rapid social change and changes in self-interest, such as happens in critical situations. A critical situation can be said to arise when an individual is confronted by a chaotic external environment which he cannot interpret and which he wants to interpret or needs to interpret. Critical situation. <clears throat> critical situations furnish psychological conditions that make individuals suggestible. Well, what are some critical situations? Here's the South after the Civil War, completely devastated. Nearly all the major battles fought on, on, uh, on southern land. Well, what are the psychoeconomics of the lynching mob in that critical situation? It is by now firmly established that the roots of mob actions that lead to lynchings lie deep in the economic context of the culture. I want to say I think that as psychologists and, and mental health people who are interested in, in, in human beings, we don't spend enough time on economics. Economics is so important. I emphasize that a lot. I talk about psychoeconomics. The official reaction of churches in the community were largely determined by the economic status of the members. Analysis of the lynchings occurring during any given period reveals the economic dislocations of the communities where the lynchings took place. The higher the price of cotton, the fewer the lynchings. A primary condition of such mob formation is a discrepancy between the status people feel is rightfully theirs and the status they have or fear they will soon have if nothing is done to prevent the values which they hold. Starting to sound familiar? Now let's look at Germany after World War I. <coughs> Hyperinflation undermined the German economy. Here's the Scranton Times showing Germany's price of defeat. Here's a woman with all these bills. I don't know what she's doing with them there. A guy with a wheelbarrow full of money. It's worthless. And here are some quotes. The little man was beginning to feel more and more helpless and far removed in Germany after World War I. Loss of status and insecurity because of that was the main worry of this large and growing group. What does status give us? It gives us control. If we have status, I, I, I mean something. I can say something to somebody, they'll do what I say, I can get stuff I need, I can take care of my family. So, no status, you can't do it. New recruits for white-collar jobs were coming more and more from the lower classes. A time of utter misery now set in for the family. I had to leave school. Once again, we came to know hunger. An abysmal hatred flared up in me against the regime that could not provide employment for a family man who had done his duty in the war. Morals, ethics, faith, love, loyalty, all were destroyed in the delirium of inflation in Germany after World War I. Well, now let's look at critical conditions in the USA. The disenfranchised. Disenfranchisement is not as critical in the USA, of course, as it was in the South after the Civil War or in Germany post-World War I, but it begins to approach it for an increasingly large proportion of voters. This creates a hunger for a strong authority to restore order and values and an explanation, usually in the form of scapegoating, for the loss of economy and status. In fact, the reasons for the loss of economy and status are more complex. What are some of those reasons? Structural reasons for American disenfranchisement. Well, one is the role of mergers and acquisitions in creating the structurally unemployed and underemployed. Another is the role of the emerging planetary economy in creating the structurally unemployed and underemployed. And another is the role of mechanization in creating the structurally unemployed and underemployed. Let's look in a little more detail at each of these causes of structural disenfranchisement. First of all, 
In the mid-1980s, I was teaching organizational psychology at Aurora University outside of Chicago. And there, one of my students was a supervisor in a manufacturing company. He said this, and I've always remembered it. My memory is not that good. I don't remember a lot of events. My semantic memory is better than my event memory. This is something I remember the, one, the first time he said. The first time we were bought, he said, the new owners cut a lot of fat. We were lean and effective. We were the best we'd ever been. The second time we were bought, the new owners had to pay the debt from the purchase. And they cut into muscle. The third time we were bought, the new owners had even more debt. They cut into bone. Ah. Well, while some mergers and acquisitions made good business sense, many, and perhaps most, were leveraged buyouts for profit only. Personally, I regard this as a kind of legal piracy. I think we ought to allow it, but it is allowed and people do it. Purchasing companies financed with debt, flipping them to another purchaser for more debt, resulted in economic wins for the flippers and economic losses for many, most, or all of the workers. This resulted directly and indirectly in a huge loss of middle class jobs, which were not replaced in commensurate numbers in other industries and contributed substantially to income inequality. So that's mergers and acquisitions. Now let's move on to the emerging global economy. Lester Thoreau is an economist who observed that the USA's domination of world trade for half a century or so after World War II was a one-time bubble. It couldn't continue. The rest of the world was either third world not mechanized or the first world were smashed to pieces. And here we were, standing on top of all of it, stronger than we've been going into the war, pumping out stuff out of the, uh, uh, out of the uh, uh, industries. Well, that couldn't last forever. So what happens? There's international manufacturing. The relocation of manufacturing jobs outside the USA was inevitable, given the combination of growing manufacturing capacity in other countries and lower wage workers. It was bound to happen. You can't stop it. Some businesses relocated for profit. A lot of them for survival. They said, we've got to do this or we're going to go under. They were right. Companies increasingly identified as international and genuinely were. Trade agreements like NAFTA were after the fact attempts to put some structure on the internationalization of manufacturing that was already happening. They didn't lead it. They followed it. The idea was, let's try and get some grip on this thing, because this, this horse is running out of the barn. <coughs> and finally, the mechanization of manufacturing has resulted in the loss of a lot of those jobs. Here's a car being made. Do you see any people in that, in that assembly line? I don't. They're all robots. The one person is running the computer that makes it all happen. So, not only are there disenfranchised formerly middle class men, but there are the women who love them. This is a comment, a uh, writing from Tina Brown in The Guardian. Liberal feminists, young and old, need to question the role they played in Hillary's demise. The two weeks of media hyperventilation over grab her by the pussygate, when the airwaves were saturated with aghast liberal women equating Trump's gross comments with sexual assault, had the opposite effect on multiple women voters in the heartland. These are resilient women, often working two or three jobs, for whom boorish men are an occasional occupational hazard, not an existential threat. They rolled their eyes over Trump's unmitigated coarseness, but still bought into his spiel that he'd be the greatest job producer who ever lived. Oh, and they wondered why his behavior was any worse than Bill's. Missing this pragmatic response by so many women was another mistake of Robbie Mook Robbie Mook's campaign data nerds. They computed that America's women would all be as outraged as the ones they came home to at night. But pink slips have hit entire neighborhoods and towns. The angry white working class men who voted in such strength for Trump do not live in an emotional vacuum. They are loved by white working class women. Their wives, daughters, sisters, and mothers who participate in their remainder pain. It is everywhere in the interviews. My dad lost his business. My husband hasn't been the same since his job at the factory went away. The opioid crisis uh, certainly gives us uh, a window into this. The bottom line is heroin. The upper line is 
opioid analgesics, you see the way those are going. Death's problem. That's uh, 1999 through 2014. The disparity of wealth uh, is another way of looking this thing. Uh, look at the top 10%. Most of that graph is the top 10%. The bottom 50% are down there at the bottom, and they're not looking very well, are they? In the, there's been a lot of mudslinging or selective brainwashing. Um, selective brainwashing if the consumers are just looking at this, which they have an option to. Um, uh, Rush Limbaugh, this picture is from 1993, and uh, Roger Ellis uh, was running Fox News, and, and they nurtured grievance, they denied the structural issues, they scapegoated. 40% of Trump voters got their news from Fox. Certainly this contributed to the problem. Uh, okay, so that is the disenfranchised. Next, health care. In 2010, when the Affordable Care Act, Beltway Democrats congratulated themselves on their victory while the rest of us were perplexed and confused about what the hell it meant. I gave a presentation in Maryland that year at, at uh, Division 36 of APA on, on psychotherapy, religion, and spirituality. And, uh, and I stayed with a guy who was a PR guy for, for the Democrats. And they're just congratulating themselves. Yeah, we did it. We passed it. Yay, we're great. We're finally, you know. And I'm coming from Chicago, and everybody's saying, what the fuck is this? What does it mean? We don't know. So they were totally out of touch with the rest of the country. President Obama said it was a beginning. Quite right. Would have to be adjusted. Quite right. But the recalcitrant Republicans in Congress prevented any adjustment, refused to engage in refinement, scapegoated the ACA. The administration failed to make the case to the country about why health care reform was needed, what it needed to include, why the ACA was the way it was, and why it couldn't be tweaked going forward. The Republicans won that PR fight. They pinned the blame for the ACA's problem on the Democrats. Three, the third factor is what I call delusion by measurement. The administration and the Democrats simply weren't taking good numbers. In 2012, CNN reported there are far more jobless people in the United States than you might think. A person is counted as part of the labor force if they have a job or looked for one in the last four weeks, but only 63.6% .6 of Americans over 16 fall into that category. Millions of non-working adults have given up looking. It's the lowest labor force participation since 1981. And I'll remind you that Ronald Reagan was elected in 1980. Well, here's a CNN chart. USS manufacturing employment is actually numerically at 1941 levels. Not proportionately, numerically. There's the same amount of people working in factories now as there were in 1941, approximately. Uh, but the productivity is up. The blue line is productivity. It's the automation, making more and more productivity possible. The orange line is jobs, and you can see the difference there. Delusion by, here's the official employment figure. The official employment figure says unemployment is under 8%. That's what Obama said. That's what Hillary Clinton said. That's the numbers they were given. But the actual unemployment is a closer to 35% structural. They didn't get it. The Republicans knew it. And they were talking to those people. This is the GDP. Delusion by <coughs> measurement again. GDP looks pretty damn good. The lower number is changed to $2,009, and the higher number is, is just the dollars the way they're expressed now. But however you look at that, that looks wonderful, and this is what the Dems were saying. A rising tide floats all boats. Well, not enough boats were floating. So delusion by measurement is another contributor to the problem. The Dems just weren't getting good numbers because they didn't look in the right way. This is, what the, uh, this is when I started to draw the pie chart. I, I was talking with this uh, uh, Democratic strategist who, who was uh, in a key role in a successful national campaign. And was like, no, what the fuck happened? And we, were, we had a four-hour conversation about it. And, uh, with his family. 
Uh, and he said to me, we didn't have a primary, we had a coronation. Boom. Okay. That's from a Democratic guy, a strategist. Clinton joins Al Gore and John Kerry in the better qualified but didn't win circle of Democrats. That's worth thinking about. I hope the Dems are thinking about that. I'm wondering what to do. Now, the Republicans did have a real primary, and they coalesced behind the winner, even though he wasn't really one of them. They had it out. Trump won. Next, the Republicans have had a long-term strategy for a generation or more of gradually um, uh, winning, gradually setting up a foundation to win. Newt, Gring Newt Gingrich and Ralph Reed have been working at it for that long. They've been uh, together and separately encouraging people to be on school boards, be on uh, little towns, just everywhere they could possibly get in, starting groups, starting circles, nurturing them, giving them some money, and giving them encouragement. And that has resulted in Republicans, uh, in fact, being in charge across a lot of the country. The Republican strategy of refusing to cooperate with the Obama administration in governing led to deadlock, which the Republicans successfully pinned on the Democrats in the PR war. The reason government's not working is because of the Democrats. Well, that carried it. Republican congressional investigations of Clinton for the Benghazi tragedy and her emails were predominantly political tactics, seasons with genuine, genuine personal hatred. They succeeded in painting her as devious and untrustworthy. And here's a proposition that purely comes from me. As political cultures, Republicans want to win. They look at winning. Democrats want to be confirmed. I leave that to others to test. Next, Comey and the FBI. As director of the FBI, Comey was charged with investigating Clinton for violating national security. He did that, and he came back to Congress and said, she was careless but not criminal. The Dems sighed with relief, case closed, and then, the October reinvestigation. How did that happen? Well, Hillary Clinton trusted Huma Abedin, who was married to Anthony Weiner. Anthony Weiner was Carlos Danger, texting those things about himself, and so he was under investigation. And in the process of investigating Weiner, on his laptop were Huma Abedin's emails, some of which involved Hillary Clinton, and some of which had national security stuff on them. Oh dear, so Comey says, uh, hey guys, I found some shit here, and we got it's, we got to reopen it, and that hurt. People are doing Comey bashing. I don't, I, I don't see what, I, I think that was what Comey had to do. He had said, it's over. I checked it, and it's over, and then it, more, this more stuff comes out. That's what happened. Misogyny is certainly a factor. There are some people who just would not vote for a woman, period. Complicating that, I think, is this question about feminism and femininity. Um, this, uh, I gotta hurry up. This is called Resting Bitch Face. It is actually a fashion uh, photographer thing. The fashion photographer will say, give me Resting Bitch Face. I gotta move on. Linguist George Lakoff emphasizes that our lives are influenced by the central metaphors we use. Republicans talk values, the rights of parents, especially fathers, to provide for, protect, and defend their families, and by extension, officials to protect the country. Democrats talk statistics, percentages of unemployment, GDP, etc. And there's a question about how all that relates to the issue of bathroom choice, which was very much in the news running up to the election and may have influenced some of the electorate. Finally, Russian intervention. Uh, is it finally not quite? Yeah, pretty much. Russia has a long history of intervening in the affairs of other countries from Ottoman times through the Soviet Union to today. Trump's businesses may be substantially supported by Russian investment. Is that strategic? <coughs> the extent of Russian intervention in the election is as yet untold. So, there's the pie chart. Uh, the um, uh, proportions are approximate and subject to being changed by further reflection and information, but that's all that stuff. The disenfranchised 
of middle class and former middle class, the democratic coronation, misogyny, health care, successful Republican strategy over a generation or more, the issue of central metaphor, delusion by measurement, Cheney and the F uh, Comey, sorry, and the FBI and Russian intervention. The, the largest piece is disenfranchised? I think so.